going to tell you pretty soon to turn off your phones. So that's a good reminder. Someone's phone is giving me a reminder. So go ahead and do it early. Merry meet. Welcome to the beloved community known as the Unitarian Universalist Church of Amherst. I'm Reverend Michelle Buhait, and I am the minister of this congregation. My pronouns, which I offer to create a truly inclusive and brave space for all to live into the fullness of their identities, are she and her. I'm joined up front today by our guest speaker, professional storyteller Lorna Charnota. Um, we had uh, a last minute change in piano playing, um, so you know what that means. I will, it's a good thing I wore my sneakers. Um, so I will be dashing back and forth and we will just all agree that it looks dignified. <laughs> I appreciate you going along with that. As Unitarian Universalists, we are people of a wide path, engaging in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning and coming together to make a difference. We're so glad that you have chosen to be here virtually and in person. Throughout the month of December, we are exploring the topic of wonder. And today we allow ourselves not only to wonder about the labels we assign ourselves or are assigned by others, but also to engage in a childlike sense of wonder and self-discovery. I have placed a label of superhero on my friend Amy Malachowski who is here to help us sing because you might hear the laryngitis that's happening and the singing part, oh, not so much. So I am grateful and please wear that label with pride. So for those of you gathered in the chapel, I invite you to put your phones on airplane mode, not just silencing them, but actually putting them into that sleepy time. Um, we have issues with web connectivity and even if you're not using your phone, it's drawing. Um, and so this way, our folks who are connecting via the live stream can have a, a good experience and not have too much disruption. <clears throat> also, a reminder for those of you who are wearing the assisted hearing devices, please make sure you have only turned those up to a maximum of four. It doesn't really get any louder after that, it just gets worse. Um, <laughs> so, um, so only to bring up your sound to four. I promise that is the best experience for you. We are a beloved community, a gathering of people who have chosen to journey together, to encourage one another, and to be part of something important and life-changing. Because we aspire to be such a people, we make bold promises about how we will strive to be with one another. I invite you to join me in uh, reciting our congregational covenant. Together we promise to gather in compassionate community, to celebrate diversity of thought and unity of spirit, and to seek wholeness for ourselves, our children, and our world. Don Tucker is going to help out as we uh, acknowledge the land where our church rests. As we gather, we acknowledge that our church is built on occupied land that was once nurtured and cherished by the First Nations people of this region, the Haudenosaunee, and the neutrals before them. We offer this libation as a giveaway, symbol of our respect for and deep connection with the land. May we be good stewards of the land and courageously cultivate community with all living things. We are going to sing. Amy will guide us, and love will guide us, and Les will step through the words. So if you are using the hymnal, please note that there are going to be a lot more words on the screen. We are singing the fullness of Sally Rogers' song, not just the portion that the... Um, hymnal committee decided to put into our hymnal. Um, and there are some times where the syllables are a little bit crunchy. Just smile, accept imperfection, and sing with great gusto. So I invite you to rise and body your spirit as we sing Love Will Guide Us.
into consideration what would happen if I looked over at the lyrics and left looking at the notes. <laughs> oh. It is our custom when we gather to light a chalice, the symbol of our faith that represents the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment. And so as Don lights the chalice, I offer these words. We gather around this flame that symbolizes the truth we know and the truth we seek, the community we share and the community we aspire to, the learning that enables us and the mystery that encompasses. Here we speak the languages of memory and hope. Here we are welcomed, our journeys embraced and shared. Each of us carries with us into this space cares and concerns, joys and sorrows. Together, we create the container where we can put down our burdens, knowing that we are held gently by this gathered community. For those joining virtually, I hope that you will give voice to that which is on your heart or perhaps type it into the chat in the live stream. For those here in the chapel, I invite you to come forward and to place a stone in the rippling bowl. Yes, something new has been added. So there's a round table up front with stones all the way around it. So you don't have to wait in line. You can just sort of flow like the water and place a stone into the bowl of water. I'll be at the piano. I'll see you in a moment. So come forward as you will.
we are so blessed to have as our guest today, professional storyteller, Lorna McDonald Charnota. Lorna is here to help us strip away our labels to discover the only label that really matters. Lorna is an award-winning storyteller and author who has delighted audiences in schools, libraries, festivals, including mm -hmm, our Green Festival, and conferences nationally and internationally with traditional and original stories since 1985. Accolades include the National Storytelling Network Oracle Award for Excellence in Service and Leadership, and Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Woman Who Moves the City. And so children and youth will remain in the service to partake in this special treat. And so Lorna. Thank you. <laughs> My labels are coming off, <laughs> even as I come up. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Whoop, there they go. <clears throat> I'm sure that there's none of them that really count, but I do wear a lot of labels, and <laughs> we all do, and that's really what my talk is about today, and the story that I'm going to tell you. Um, imagine if, and this, is, this was in the blurb that I sent in, is just imagine if the labels that people wore came with care instructions, just like our clothing, you know? Um, our, clothes, our clothes labels tell us how to take care of them, tells us what they're made out of, and we come to expect them to function in that way. Um, but when we put that kind of label on a person, it's kind of dangerous because we're expecting them to act and behave in a certain way, and it may not, it may not happen. So I'm wearing a thermal... Uh, shirt today, and I expect it to keep me warm. That if it wasn't going to keep me warm, I might just throw it away. But if I did that, I might forget how soft it is <laughs> and how well it fits. <laughs> but think about that. With the labels that we put on people, throw it away because they don't live up to our expectations, but forget how soft they are and how well they fit in our lives. So that is part of the message that I'd like to deliver today. It's also, I think, impossible to live in a world without labels. How do you find your friend's house if the street isn't labeled? It's very difficult. How do you find the store that you want to go to if there isn't a sign labeling that store? I just returned from Italy, and some of those cities have very narrow alleyways, and they twist and they turn in every direction. Venice in particular, I loved Venice. But you could go walking, and if you don't have a map telling you how to get there, if you don't have street signs, you can get very easily lost. So labels can have a benefit, but when we put those labels on other people, Something happens. It's the first thing we see. I'm sure when I got up here, you couldn't miss it, right? You couldn't miss it. And I'm going to just start stripping some of these off right away because I know they're going to fall off. I don't even know which one's on the floor. It doesn't matter. Um, but you know, when we're born, even before we're born, a label is placed on us. And I'm going to talk about that label in the very end, because that's the one that really matters. When we're conceived, we get another label, and that says our last name. You know, do we belong to our mother's family, our father's family? So we get that last name. And the, the doctor gives us our next label. It's a boy. It's a girl. It's healthy. We have a problem. So that's our second label, actually our third label, but it's the second one that's given to us by humankind. And then all after that, the labels get slapped on us, and we put labels on ourselves. The labels are important, I mentioned before, to find our way, but you know, think about when you, you were maybe in school in kindergarten or preschool, 
When I was growing up, they didn't have preschool. That was home <laughs> with my mother. But kindergarten, you know, and then the teacher puts chair and table and door and window, labels everything, so that I can start to recognize the symbols that represent words so I can learn how to read and I can learn what this is and I can learn what that is. So labels can be very helpful. but They can also be harmful. So I'm going to start taking these off before they all fall off. This one says I'm tall. I shrank. I really did. As I've gotten older, I lost like almost an inch. When I was growing up, I was the tallest kid in my class. And I thought I was never going to stop growing. And it was really annoying because I was towering like a rainforest over all of the little people in the classroom. <laughs> I once watched, uh, uh, my father used to like to watch chiller theater. I don't know if any of you remember. It was horror movies. And um, I only watched one. And it terrified me so much, I never watched another one. It was the 50-foot woman. <laughs> You know, she grew and grew to be 50 foot tall. She grew out of the top of her roof. She terrorized the countryside, killing everybody, stomping on houses. I was tall. <coughs> Ugly. I don't know why I thought I was ugly. I suppose, you know, I'm going to show you something that no human has. No, I may be better. Well, I will. OK, I'm going to show you something that no human being that I don't know by the first name has ever seen, OK? Look at these ears, great big ears. Now, that was your only look. You'll never see them again. <laughs> you will never see them again. Um, I came home crying from school because the kids started calling me elephant ears. But my mother took me to see the movie Dumbo. <laughs> that changed everything. I thought I could fly. I can fly. <laughs> I just don't use my ears to do this. So maybe that was the first time I thought I was ugly. Um, kids used to pick on me all the time. Now, look what's underneath ugly. <gasps> it says I'm pretty. Oh, boy, oh, boy. But you know what? I have to do my makeup and my hair and choose the right clothes. So sometimes labels can come with sorrow. Sometimes labels can come with a lot of responsibility. If I want to be pretty and I want somebody to see that label, i got to live up to it. That's a lot of trouble. I'm a Republican. Wait a minute. Over here somewhere it said Democrat. Maybe that's the one that fell off. It was there someplace. <laughs> I used to be a Democrat. I changed my affiliation. You can hate me if you want, but that label's not important. I'm young. <laughs> I once was told I was too young for a job. So I had to go out and I went to beauty school. I went to a modeling agency and they taught me how to look old. <laughs> no, they taught me how to look sophisticated. Next time I went, I, I got that job the next time I went in. But some people do think that I look younger than I am. I'm 68. Some people think I look younger than I am. But you know what? After a while, <laughs> we all get the bumps, we all get the wrinkles, we all get those things that say, hey, you're not as young as you used to be. So if I want to be young, I've got to live up to that. So why don't I just embrace old? But old, that, that has a whole lot of meaning to it. To some people, age is a good thing. It means you're wise, but you know what? I just recently lost another position that I had for a while because the younger people took over. So I guess I'll take that label off. Stupid. <laughs> yep. I couldn't pass math. I couldn't pass math. I couldn't even pass a gym class. But I, I did not do well with math and science. But I did really well in the arts. So I guess I was smart. Oop. There goes some more labels. Woman, smart, talented. I like that one. But you know what? If I mess up, somebody's going to think I'm not talented. I'm white. None of them matter. 
None of them matter. Did I get them all? Wait, forgot one. I'm a Christian. I am a Christian. I followed other paths. I came back to my Christianity. But a lot of people have in their own mind what that means because Christianity has a whole lot of different belief systems within it. So my belief as a Christian may not be the same as someone else's belief as a Christian, and I'll take that label off too. I don't like to label myself. Some labels are beneficial, some are not. But whatever label I slap on myself, I have to live up to it. Now that doesn't mean I want to shirk that responsibility and not live up to it. But it means I don't want to put that pressure on myself to, be, to meet someone else's expectations of what it means to be who I am. I'm going to tell you a story because I think this is a wonderful story. It was written by uh, my mentor, my storytelling mentor who lives in Illinois. His name is Dan Ketting. Uh, once, uh, I, this was very, very uh, uh, obvious to me when I was in Italy because we talked about how uh, the cities in Italy, Venice and Genoa and uh, Amalfi and all of these cities in, in Italy used to be city-states before Italy was a country. And in Europe, that's the way it was. There wasn't England and there wasn't France and there wasn't Spain or Italy. They were all these city-states. And sometimes cities fought with each other. And that happens even in our world today. Um, that kind of mentality is still in place in parts of the world that are not living in a unified country. Well, there were these two warriors in one of those, in two of those city-states. And their armies came together to do battle on the battlefield. And it was a bloody, bloody war. Many men were killed. Many horses were killed. Many spirits were broken until finally only these two warriors remained. They stood among the fallen on that bloody battlefield with the birds coming down to pick at the bodies that lay there. And they fought each other. And they fought each other throughout the day and into the night. Three long days they fought. They were exhausted. They seemed to be matched, but one of them had to leave and one of them had to die, and that was the way it was. They were determined that was it. And after that third day of fighting, the two men stood facing each other with brutality and anger and hatred in their eyes, maybe not even remembering why they had come, holding a shield and a sword and not being able to lift them any longer because they were so exhausted. And they made a truce, temporary though it might have been. We will rest the night. And tomorrow... We will fight, and only one of us will leave alive. The other will feed the earth. One man sat with his back pressed against a rock. Another man sat not far away with his back pressed against a tree. In the darkness, they sat in silence until one man finally spoke. I have a daughter. She grows more beautiful day by day. She looks like her mother. And in the darkness, there was a reply from the other man. I have a son. 
He is strong. His arm is powerful, and someday he will be a good warrior like me. And then they began to exchange stories about their families and their villages, their countrysides, their beliefs, and then the sun rose. And when the sun rose, the two men feeling more rested, picked up their weapons, shield on one arm, sword in hand, and they faced each other, almost nose to nose, ready to do battle, but unable to lift the sword against each other. In silence they turned and went home. Why? Dan Ketting finishes the story by saying, because once you know the story of someone else, you cannot hate them. It's a beautiful story. So what does that have to do with labels? Well, underneath all of those labels, there's a story. I told you my story for most of my labels, the ones that I, I could keep on <laughs> and take off. If we strip those labels away, you know, when we listen to the story of someone else, those labels fall off. We start to learn who they really are what they really have in their lives, who they see themselves as. And maybe they don't see themselves as anything significant or important. And maybe it falls on us to say, you know, you've got value. You're, you're a good human being. You mean something to someone. Now you're my friend. So the labels are gone, and many things are possible. Can we live in a world without labels? I don't think so. It's not the labels and what they say that's the problem. The problem is how we read those labels. The problem is that we haven't learned to use our x-ray vision I told you I'm a Christian, and I know that there are many, many different beliefs here, but I am a Christian, and so I believe God has x-ray vision. He can burn right through all of those labels. He can make them go away. He sees me for who I really am. We have a friendship, God and I. Somebody else may not see through my labels, but as long as God can see through my labels, I know I'm going to be okay. So that's what I wanted to share with you today about labels. Now, the secret, what is that one label that was put on us that we can't erase, that will always be there, that really matters? It's written right here. There's a third eye, some people believe. I think that's significant because I think that is where the label resides. And the label says, Beloved. Strip all the other labels off, throw them all away, and know that you are beloved. And when I look at you, I look at me. I see your label. You see mine. We are both beloved. That's our connection. And the sweetest kiss, you know how that label beloved gets there in my opinion? It's the sweetest kiss in the world is when God kisses us on the forehead and the label sticks. When was the last time somebody kissed you on the forehead? It really is the sweetest kiss. 
It's not gratuitous in any way. It has no strings attached. It's just very lovely. I know in this age of COVID, we have to be careful who we go around kissing. But if you're sitting beside somebody right now that you can trust, just take a moment. Kiss, just, I mean, really, truly, just kiss them right there. I'll give you a second. You're going to love it. Isn't that nice? Doesn't that feel good? That is the sweetest kiss. You just kissed everybody on Beloved. And I hope it stuck on you. That's what I have to say. I had the best seat in the house for that moment. Oh, to watch you tenderly kissing each other. Now I have the second best seat in the house as I scamper to the piano and you all sing with Amy. Our service is drawing to an end, which means our service to the world is ready to begin. Let me tell you about some of the opportunities to connect and serve in the days to come. In a moment, Doreen Park is going to share some words regarding our pantry ministry. Throughout this month, we are sharing the offering with the Amherst Little Free Pantry, a vital ministry of this congregation. So I'm going to tell you how that works before Doreen comes up so that you can be getting ready. So all designated funds, whether that's a check that says UU Amherst with pantry in the memo line or cash in an envelope that says pantry, all designated funds will go to the pantry. And half of the undesignated funds will go to the pantry. So if you just toss cash in the basket, 
half of that will go to the pantry and half will go to the other operating uh, needs of the congregation. And of course, if you're um, paying your pledge, put pledge in the memo line um, so that we can make sure that we put that in the right column. Doreen, I would love for you to come up and tell us more about the pantry. glasses on. Again, my name is Doreen Park, and about two and a half years ago, I was approached by Angela Warren if I would like to learn how to stock the pantry. We went to church on a Sunday, and she showed me the ropes. It was kind of like playing store as I was in retail for the early part of my work career. I met with Cheryl, and we discussed her needing help, so I took on the role of vice chair of the Little Free Pantry. As our commitment to this group ministry has grown and the need has grown by our pantry users, Marie Evans has met with a tax consultant on the pantry applying for a 501c3. <clears throat> this would give us access in applying for grants to various foundations, as most of them want to see your tax status as a nonprofit. We do not fall under the church or the endowments 501 C3 status. We would need our own. The cost will be approximately $1,500 as a lawyer will be needed and various paperwork will be needed to be filed with New York State. I applied for a grant last fall with the Junior League of Buffalo, whose purpose is both educational and charitable philanthropy. They run the Decorator Show House, if anyone's familiar with that, and this is where they get their money to provide grants to nonprofits. I do believe that we were overlooked as we are not a nonprofit, and we also must provide a project that the pantry would be working on. Um, this was an $8,000 grant, but unfortunately we did not get that. One thought we have discussed in our pantry meetings is the possibility of insulating the pantry due to the, uh, the pantry cupboards due to the liquids freezing in the winter. But this is an ongoing project for us and it's still in the works as we discuss further. Marlena Rice, Lor Lorraine Marcus and myself have formed a grant writing subcommittee for this pantry and Marlena and I will be going to a grant writing course this Thursday at Williamsville North High School. Uh, I seen it in a booklet that was sent to my home and I said, geez, what a perfect opportunity to, you know, get some information on how to write grants. Um, in closing, I would like to remind the congregation to remember Maria Cirillo at this time of year with a Christmas card sent to High Point Rehab Center. I will place an all-church email today with the full address for you to send a loving thought to her. Without her initiative to form the Amherst Little Free Pantry, our local community would be without this great mission that means so much for food and security. Thank you. Thank you. And you can also um, donate food. That, that's okay too. So, and I would say all of the above. Um, but exciting news to see the pantry that grew as from a little seed of an idea to now ready to, to go out into the world. Makes mama proud. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm more of an auntie. I've been on the, on the sidelines. Um, I do want to um, be sure to connect you. Ellen, if you can just raise your hand so that people know who to go to. If you have an urge to be part of the service, do the chalice lighting, or um, are ready to volunteer in other capacities, Ellen is the one you talk to. She is the one with the clipboard, and she knows how to use it. Um, so uh, I hope that you will participate fully. It takes your 
uh, relationship with the church to a whole new level when you participate. <clears throat> also, just marking your calendars, our Christmas Eve service will be at 4 p.m. on Saturday, December 24th. Many of our folks are uncomfortable driving after dark, and with sunset happening at 4.45, we should be able to get everyone safely home before it is full dark. We will have just the one service at 4 o'clock, which will be offered in person, and I'm going to say live streamed. A recording will be available within a day or two on our YouTube channel, UU Amherst. Um, please do not anticipate a quick turnaround like, oh, I can't go at four, but I'll just watch it at seven. Um, we have grandchildren too, y'all. So <laughs> we're not going to, we will be timely, but we have things to do. And I want to be sure to let you know how you can give um, to the mission and programming of this congregation. You can go to our website, uumhurst.org, click on the giving link, or you can text your gift, 833-987-1968, or you can just do it the old-fashioned way. Um, we will accept all of your generosity. Because we pick fruit from trees we did not plant. We drink water from wells we did not dig. And this is as it should be, so long as we dig and plant for those who will come after us. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing our closing blessing and then remain standing afterward as we extinguish the chalice. Hmm. All right, so travel light. I'm going to try to keep it all in one key. Here we go. <laughs> Travel light and travel easy Till I see you once again Travel light and travel easy And remember I'm your friend May the road rise up to greet as you leave your past behind, I will think about you gently, and I'll hold you in my mind. Look at one another. Travel I and travel easy till I see again, travel light and travel easy, and remember I'm your friend. Don, would you be willing to extinguish our chalice? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. <laughs>